Okay, so uh, we're coming to our third uh, session in this block, and you've just seen messages from some of our sponsors, but some of our sponsors also do talks. And the next one uh, I'd like to invite to us is uh, Alexis from Numberly. Uh, Alexis, hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right and see me as well? This works perfectly, and we can see you too. Um, you are uh, in Paris at the moment or in France? Yeah, in France and south of France, actually, this time. But I usually live in Paris and, uh, and work in Paris. Are you ready to uh, do your presentation? Sure, I guess so. Uh, I will just start sharing my screen and, uh, and prepare everything, if you allow. Yes, oh, sure. Okay. And let's see if that works. <laughs> Uh, so, hello everyone. I'm uh, really happy to be remotely, as you understood, uh, uh, with you today. Um, in this talk, I will detail Cassandra and uh, Scylla low-level architecture uh, and explain how it's used uh, by Python Cassandra driver and show you how we extended it to write a Python driver for Scylla. There will be diagrams, uh, emojis, um, Python code, and uh, hopefully some amazing performance graphs as well. Um, let me introduce uh, a bit about myself. So uh, as Martin uh, already told you, and you can judge from my accent, I'm, uh, I'm French, I'm Alexis, uh, and I'm a CTO at Numberly, uh, who happens as well to be a, a proud sponsor for EuroPython since uh, 2014. Um, we are digital marketing experts and we help brands establish uh, a, a, a relationship, a digital relationship with their customers. On the open source uh, world, I, I'm a Gentoo Linux uh, developer, where I'm part of the cluster and containers teams, uh, which means that I spend uh, some of my time uh, working on uh, packaging uh, distributed databases such as uh, MongoDB and Scylla. Um, or work on packaging some other cluster related tools and work with my friends on uh, the Docker uh, Gen2 Linux images. Uh, I'm also open source contributor and enthusiast. Um, I've been contributing to MongoDB, to Scylla, to Apache Airflow, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Python Software Foundation uh, contributing member, which means that I spend a fair amount of my time uh, working on or contributing to Python-based uh, open source projects. Before we start, I wanted to uh, introduce you to a fact that you may not know already, but uh, since Py EuroPython is using Discord, I found it interesting to share to you um, that uh, Discord is using Scylla as well. Uh, if you are interested in understanding uh, what they do, I invite you to uh, to check out this uh, the link right here where Mark Smith uh, introduces uh, how Discord is using Scylla. It's very interesting, so check it out if you want. Also, this is an advanced talk uh, as advertised, so I will suppose that you are familiar with the basics of uh, consistent hashing and Cassandra. Uh, if that's not the case, or if you simply want to know more about consistent hashing uh, and even use it in your Python applications, I'm allowing myself to also introduce you to uh, the talk I gave uh, on this uh, very subject in a previous Euro Python uh, edition. But fear not, I've uh, still worked on uh, not making this a big problem for this presentation. So you, you, you should be able to follow along, and no problem, uh, even if you don't know exactly the details of consistent hashing. Let's get started now, and um, let me introduce you um, to Cassandra and Scylla token reading architectures. Uh, we'll see all they have in common, uh, but also what Scylla has done that makes it uh, special and worth a dedicated Python driver. The first thing to know is that a Cassandra or Scylla cluster uh, is a cluster, is a collection of nodes or instances that can be visualized as a ring. All the nodes uh, in this ring should be homogeneous using a shared nothing approach. This means that um, there's nothing special about a node in this topology. Uh, uh, one node, one Cassandra node on the, on the ring uh, or any uh, Scylla node on the ring uh, has no special role or anything special about it. There is no primary or secondary or anything. They all do the same thing. 
This ring is called um, a token ring, in which the positions of the nodes on the ring define token ranges and token range partitions. You can see that before, if you go clockwise on, on the ring, the range that is uh, preceding a node is the token range that, and, or the partition that it is responsible for. A partition is just a subset of data um, that is stored on a node. In CQL, um, the, the Cassandra query language, a partition appears as a group of sorted rows and is the unit of access of uh, queried data. Uh, this data is usually replicated across nodes thanks to a setting that is called the replication factor. The replication factor uh, defines how data is replicated on nodes. Uh, for example, a replication factor of two means that a given token or token range or partition will be stored on two nodes. This is the case here where partition one and two is stored on node X and you can see that partition two is also stored on node Y, while uh, the partition one is uh, stored on node Z. That means that if we were to lose node X, we could still read the data uh, from partition one uh, from node Z. This is how high availability is achieved and how Cassandra and Scylla uh, favor availability and partition tolerance. They are called AP on the CAP theorem. Uh, this kind of token ring architecture is sensible to data distribution among uh, the nodes. Queries should, in theory, be evenly distributed between nodes. We could get an imbalance of data and query load in the above scenario, where we store data in three big partitions, and each node holds uh, one range of the previous one and, the, and one range from the next one. If one of those partitions were to grow larger than another one, we could then have an unbalance of queries and over, in sort of overload on, on them. Um, to counter um, this effect uh, that, we are, that we are calling a hot node or hot partition, we need to add more variance in partition to node allocation. And this is done uh, using what is called virtual nodes. So instead of placing physical nodes on the ring, we will place many virtual instances of them called virtual nodes. A virtual node represents a contiguous range of tokens owned by a single node. So it's just a smaller slice of a partition, but it's more shuffled between nodes. A physical node may be assigned multiple and non-contiguous. If you remember the preceding slide, it was contiguous. So this time, virtual nodes allow for non-contiguous assignment of nodes. The default um, is to split a node into 256 virtual nodes on the token ring. So this is true for Cassandra and this is true for Scylla as well. So if you look at how now the partitions are distributed among nodes, you see that, that there is more variance into this, which will uh, end up in distributing the query better. This is it for Cassandra's uh, data distribution, but Scylla goes one step further. On each Scylla node, tokens of a V node are further distributed among uh, the CPU cores of the node that are called shards. This means that the data stored on um, a Scylla cluster is not only bound to a node, but can be traced down to one of its CPU cores. This is really interesting uh, architecture and low level design. This is the feature that we will leverage on the Python Scylla uh, shard aware driver later on. And I will explain to you how. Now that we understand how data is stored and distributed on the cluster, let's see how it's queried by clients. On the physical layer, a partition is, the un is a unit of data stored on a node and is identified by a partition key. You can relate a partition key to a primary key in the SQL world. A partition key is the primary means of um, looking up a set of rows that comprise a partition. And a partition key serves to identify the node in the cluster that stores um, a given partition, as well as to distribute the data across nodes in the cluster. The partitioner or the partition hash function um, using the partition key will help us determine where the data is stored. 
on the given node in the cluster. So you take the ID, in this case, you see a colon ID, you will, this is, will be the partition key, you take the value, you apply a hash function on it, the partitioner hash function, which by default on Cassandra and Scylla is murmur hash tree. And this will give you a token. A token is like a number, it just, just actually is a number that will be placed on the token ring. And from where it leads on token ring, you will find out which nodes is, which node is responsible for this data. That's as simple as this. Okay, so let's recap now. On Cassandra, the hash of the partition key gives you a token telling you which node has the data that you are looking for. We can see this uh, architecture as a shard pair node architecture because from, the, from a token, you get to a node. So shard pair node. On Scylla, the same hash of the partition key, from the same of partition key gives you the same token, but the same token not only is not only telling you which node has the data, but also which CPU's core in this node is responsible for handling it. So this is a shard pair core architecture. This is how it's called. So Cassandra is shard pair node, while Scylla is shard pair core. Now let's see how uh, does a client driver query a Cassandra or a Scylla cluster. Because now that we know this, we could guess and expect that client drivers um, uses uh, this knowledge to um, uh, find out and optimize their query plan. A naive client would go on like this. When a client connects uh, to a Cassandra or Scylla cluster, it opens a connection to every node of the cluster. When it wants to issue a query, a naive client would pick one of its connection randomly, let's say, and issue the query to the node. The node it issues the query to will be seen as the, from the client's perspective, it will act as what is called a coordinator because he's coordinating the query and he's taking the ephemeral responsibility of routing the query internally in the cluster to the right nodes that are replicas for this data. That means that are responsible for the partition the query belongs to and gathering the responses and then responding back to the client. But maybe this coordinator uh, is not a replica for the query data. If it's, the, if it's not the case, if the coordinator is not a replica for the query data, it has to issue the queries to all replicas itself. That means that you will add, it will add an extra hop inside, in, inside the cluster to, to get the responses. This is sub, suboptimal, of course, as it consumes network and processing power on the coordinator node for something that the client could have guessed in the first place, right? Because since the partitioner hash function is known, our client library can use it to predict data location on the cluster and optimize the query routing. This is what the Cassandra driver does using the token aware policy. How does it work? Token aware clients apply the partitioner logic to select the right connection to the right node and make sure that its coordinator node is also a replica of the queried data. This is cool. And this is very efficient. As a result, we save network hopes, lower uh, the, the, the cluster internal load and get reduced query latency, meaning, meaning faster queries. Um, let's see how the Cassandra driver does it uh, for real internally. So the token aware policy uh, from the point of view of the Python Cassandra driver, the partition key is seen as a routing key because it will be used to route the query, right? Um, so it is seen as a routing key, which is used to determine which node are the replicas for the query. And to allow, uh, to allow our um, Python driver to know about the partition key of a query, the query itself must be prepared as a server-side uh, uh, statement. 
this is how it looks on, on uh, in, in Python. Um, uh, Cassandra's and Scylla's prepared statements, they can, you can see them um, a bit like stored procedures in the SQL world. You see, if you see statement equals session.prepare, and then you, um, you express the, the query that you want, and when you have an argument or parameter, you just put a, an exclamation, um, an interrogation mark. And this is the recommended and most optimal way to query the data because when you have prepared uh, your, um, your query, it is validated and it lives on the server side. So you don't have to pass it and you just have to pass a reference to it and then only pass the arguments and the arguments, one of them will be the mandatory routing key, partition key, then routing key. So statement plus routing key equals nodes. And it's very, very cool. Uh, another thing to note, it is that um, um, just like prepared uh, stored procedures, uh, prepared statements are also the safest way because it, they prevent query injection. So please, in production, at the bare minimal, only use prepared statements when you uh, issue queries to Cassandra or Scylla uh, clusters. Then, uh, the Python Cassandra driver defaults to the token aware to route the query and then it also defaults to a data center aware round robin load balancing query routing policy. It's, it's a bit long, but what it means that is that it will load balance for you in a round robin fashion. So one after the other after the other like this. So it's a bare minimal uh, uh, load balancing algorithm there is but it's still pretty efficient. So don't worry if even if your uh, cluster is not spread between multiple data center, it still works. It's just, it just happens to be the default. So it's token aware plus data center aware round robin. Um, by doing so, the query routing will not only hit the right node holding a copy of the data that you seek. Remember it's called the replica, the, the replica. Uh, but also load balance the queries evenly uh, between all its replicas. So one could think, yeah, it, this is awesome and optimal. Uh, I mean, from a, a, the a Cassandra cluster point of view, it is, and we can't do better than this, um, but not with a Scylla one. Remember, Scylla uh, shards the data one way further down to node CPUs. So having a token awareness is cool, but if our client had shared awareness, it would be even cooler because this means that a, a token aware client could be extended to become a shared aware client to route its queries, not only to nodes, but right to their CPU cores. This is very interesting to do. Such drivers, they already exist as forks of the data stacks uh, Cassandra drivers. And it's true for the Java one and the Go one as well. And they have been uh, around since uh, last year, actually. Uh, but there was no uh, shard aware driver uh, for Python. And it made, it made me sad and pretty angry. So when I attended um, Scylla Submit last year in San Francisco, uh, I did some lobbying and hard lobbying on the, on, and found some Scylla uh, developers that are that were willing to help in uh, in in, uh, in 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 making this happen for Python as well. So we promised each other to make a Python shadowware driver, and good news is that we have obviously did, and I will now explain to you in details how it has been done and what we found out by doing so. Well, uh, very, very interesting uh, as well, I think. So let's start by um, checking out the expected structural differences between uh, the Cassandra driver and the Scylla driver fork. Um, the first thing to see is that uh, the token aware Cassandra driver has, when it connects for the first time to the cluster, it opens a control connection. This control connection allows your uh, Cassandra driver to know about the cluster topology, how many nodes there are, 
which are up, which are down, what are the, the schemas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, it needs to know all this. So it opens a special connection for this. And in this connection, it refreshes uh, uh, from time to time. And then it will open one connection per node, because this is how the token aware uh, policy will be applied to select the right of those connections uh, based on the, the query. And then it will be done by the famous token calculation. And that's how it's done. All right. On the shadowware uh, client perspective, we still need to know about the cluster uh, topology, uh, actually. Uh, but instead of you op opening one connection per node, we will be opening one connection per core per node. The token calculation will still be uh, useful to select the right node from the token perspective, but then we will need to add a shard ID calculation because we need to go down to the shard or the CPU core to, so to select the connection to the right core to route the queries. Let's transform this into a to-do uh, from uh, the, the, the Python code perspective. First thing is, since we will be using the same kind of control connection, we don't, we just use it uh, as is. Uh, there's nothing to change here. We will need to change the connection class object um, because now when we are gonna open a connection per core per node, uh, we will need to be able to detect um, if we are talking to a SILAC cluster or to a Cassandra cluster. Um, the SILA driver, we wanted to retain the maximum compatibility with Cassandra as well. So you can use the SILA driver to uh, discuss and query a Cassandra cluster as well. The host connection pool uh, should, will use those, um, those uh, shadowware uh, connections to op and open one connection to every, uh, every core of every node. The token calculation, um, that selects the right node will be the same. Uh, we will just use the vanilla and uh, already existing and efficient token aware policy. But then we will need to, to extend it and add uh, uh, in the cluster when you issue the query, we will need the cluster uh, class to uh, pass down the routing key to the, to the connection pool. And then we will apply the shard ID cal calculation and then implement the logic based on the shard ID of selecting the right connection to the right node to the right shard. Okay, sounds like a plan. Let's do this. Now we'll get down into the code. Um, before we, we, we go into this, I wanted to, uh, to highlight uh, and to introduce uh, Israel. Israel is a SILA developer from Israel. I know it's confusing, uh, but uh, that's how it is. Um, since I know he's in the audience, uh, that makes me a, some kind of pressure, as you can guess. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank him and uh, giving him the credits for most of uh, what I'm going to present now, especially the efforts he put into uh, CI uh, testing the SILA driver. Um, so the first thing that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, needed to be done is to add those uh, shard information to the connections. Um, so this is how it's been done. So a connection now has a shard ID uh, assigned to it and sharding information. This sharding information comes from uh, the, re the, the, the server responses uh, when we uh, issue a query. That's what is, um, what is squared in red uh, on the bottom. The, the, the logic of this uh, looks like this. Um, it is, what is interesting to note um, is that the Cassandra protocol allows only for connection uh, message options being passed on the server response. This means that when the client initially connects uh, to uh, Cassandra or Scylla, it has no way of passing any kind of information to the server. So the, we are dependent on the server's response to know about uh, uh, shard, um, shard information or whatever it, it is that we need. Um, if we look at the, the, the message options that we get back after we have connected to the server, the first one is one of the most interesting for us because uh, the SILA shard information tell, tells us um, which shard ID or core was assigned to the connection by the server. And I'm gonna say this again. This information 
tells us what shard ID or core Y is assigned um, to the connection by the server. Since we have no way of asking anything when we connect, we are dependent on the server shard allocation to the connection that we open. This is a protocol limitation. So now we are going to change the, 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 the host connection pool uh, class. Um, we need to, uh, to get a connection object for every core of the node, right? So the first thing we did is that we got rid of the single connection that we had before um, um, and replaced it with a dict where the keys are the shard ID, numerical shard ID, and the values are the connections that are bound to the specified shard. Um, the first time we connect, as you can see uh, in the first uh, square uh, rectangle, uh, the first connection allows us to detect if we are connecting to a shard aware cluster, a Scylla cluster, in, uh, for instance. And this is where we get the first uh, glance at the sharding information and we store it. Then, I, uh, the first time I, I, I saw the initial implementation like this, um, and this is the second part here with the four uh, uh, underscore in range, we can see that we are doing an insynchronous and optimistic way to get uh, a connection to every core. Why is that? We open a new connection to the node and store its shard ID plus connection object on the dict. And we will do this twice as many times there are cores on the remote node until we have a connection to all shards. Maybe. Because if you remember, the client when it connects cannot specify which shards it wants to connect to. So you just happen to connect to the server and you get a shard assigned. That's why the initial implementation was trying and saying, okay, let's, let's try twice as much as there are cores available on the remote node and hopefully we'll get, a, we'll get a full connection and a connection for every shard. If we were lucky, fine, keep on moving. If not, we would raise an exception. No, this is uh, the first time I saw this, I, I understood that there was I understood this flow in, in, uh, in the client not being able to request a specific shard ID because of the protocol limitation. So there is no deterministic and secure way to get the connection to all remote shards of a Scylla node. And connecting also uh, synchronously means that the startup of our application would be as slow as connecting to hopefully all shards of all nodes. Not acceptable. Um, so. The second thing that, uh, that, that came to my mind was, hey, this also means that all the current shard aware drivers, since it's a protocol limitation, it's not bound to Python and whatever. It's not a, a Python's problem. It's, it's a, a flow or a, a lack, maybe you know, not a flow, but rather a lack in the protocol itself. So that means that all the current shard aware drivers are lying since none of them even today can guarantee to always have a connection for a given routing key. All of this is opportunistic and optimistic. You will eventually get one, but not all your queries will be able to use the direct connection to the right shard. So I wrote an, uh, an RFC on the Scylla dev mailing list to discuss this problem. And um, the good news is that a consensus to a solution uh, was recently found. Um, it will take the form of a new shard allocation algorithm that will be placed on the server side and that will be made available as a new listening port on Scylla. So since we want and want Scylla and Cassandra on the, their default port to retain the same um, behavior, if we want to change a bit uh, and, add a, uh, and, and add on the server a new kind of allocation, port allocation, we need to do it on a new on a new port. So it will be a shard aware port, let's say. It will just use a sort of modulo on the client's um, socket source port to assign uh, the correct and calculate and assign the correct shard to the connection. So it means that the clients on their side will just have, just have 
um, uh, to calculate uh, and select the right socket source port to get a connection to the desired child ID. This is work in progress, but it's not done yet. So I worked on implementing a software and uh, optimistic and in asynchronous way of dealing with this problem. Let's see how it's been done. Um, the, the first thing is that I wrote two functions. The first one is the optimistic one. Um, it opens a connection, tries to open a connection and only stores it if the reported shard ID was not connected before. Else, we close it. So we are only interested in the uh, keeping connections to missing shard IDs. But we just open it and if it works, good. If it doesn't, we'll see later. Then I, sw I switched the, the startup logic to schedule as many optimistic of those optimistic attempts to get a connection to a missing shard ID as there are shards available on the remote node. So when you connect and you start connecting, if you have 50 cores on your remote server, you will issue asynchronously and schedule asynchronously 50 attempts to get a connection to shards. Maybe 25 of them will uh, give you uh, different and unique shard IDs connected. Maybe two of them, maybe 50 of them, lucky you. But now we don't care. It's optimistic, asynchronous, and it will go on and on again like this as we use the driver. The result is a cluster fast, uh, uh, an application startup time uh, that is as fast as the usual Cassandra driver and, and non-blocking optimistic shard connections. So um, the cluster object now, it should pass down the routing key as well um, uh, to the pool. So when you see here, when uh, you issue a query, in the in the query uh, function and we and the cluster looks up cluster object looks up for a, a connection there we added the routing key um, so that the uh, we could apply the shard id calculation this shard id calculation is a bit ob obscure and uh, uh, lucky lucky me uh, israel was there to to implement it in the first place but the first time i tried to use this pure Python implemented uh, shard ID calculation, it was very bad on the driver performance. We, we were slower than the Cassandra driver. So uh, what Israel did is to move this shard ID computation to Cython because actually the Cassandra driver is using a lot of, uh, of uh, Cython uh, in, in, in the background when you install it. And he managed to cut uh, its latency impact by almost seven. So. Uh, kudos again, uh, Israel. It was a very, a very impressive move, and it made uh, it made the difference on on the on the driver's perspective. So now let's wrap it together, and in the main shard awareness logic in the in the host connection pool. Um, so here, um, this is basically where the the connection selection happens, uh, and everything is glued together. So if we are in, uh, that's line two, if we are on uh, a shard aware uh, communication with a cluster, we will calculate the shard ID now from uh, the routing key uh, token. Then we will use the routing key, uh, the shard ID, and we will try to look up in our uh, connection dict if we happen to have a connection to this direct uh, shard ID, so to this direct core. If we, if we do triumph, we will use this direct connection to the right core to enroute the query there, almost. Uh, that's perfect. Uh, that's the best case scenario. If not, uh, we will pray and issue asynchronously a new attempt to connect to a missing shard. Maybe it will be the shard we were trying to look at before. Maybe it will be another one. But that means that as much as you issue queries to your cluster, the more chance you get to have a connection to all shards and all cores. And if you didn't have one, we will just random pick uh, an existing connection. So we would be just as if we were using the Cassandra driver. 
now that we have seen the implementation details, does the Scylla driver live up uh, to our expectations? Is it fast? And how did it work in production? Because to us uh, and, and to me, the, the real values and the, are from, uh, must be taken from production. So let's see. The first expectations that we check uh, was the, an increase. We expect an increase in the number of open connections on, from the cluster's perspective. And this is a check because now that we are opening not only one connection to each node, but one connection to each core of each node, we, we expected to see uh, uh, this increase. So you can see uh, with, from the annotation when we, re when we deployed the Scylla driver, we saw this increase. The second one was also uh, an expectation to have more C CPU requirements because you open more connections, meaning that your driver and your CPU has to handle more connections and keep alive, et cetera, for, for, to, to keep those uh, connections alive. Uh, we saw that um, we had to increase uh, from on our Kubernetes deployments uh, a bit uh, the CPU uh, limits to avoid CPU saturation and throttling. But then what about the major impact we wanted? We want faster queries, lower latencies, right? How did that translate for real? This is how what our graph looked like. I was like, ha, ah, wow, it's amazing. We gained between 15 and 25% performance boost. And at Lumberly, we like to look at uh, our graph on the worst case scenario possible. That means that if you check this out, uh, this is the max uh, of our uh, processing. This is the, 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 the worst latency that we get from our application perspectives. Um, what's inter interesting to note as well is that the performance boost is progressive. Since we connect to shards in the background in an optimistic fashion, uh, the longer our application runs, the more chance it, to have a connection um, to all shards it has. And then the lower the latency gets because we start to have, always have uh, the right connection to the right core for every query. So you can see that right after the deployment, we get already a fair amount of performance boost, but the longer the time passes, the more shards connected, the better the latency. It was very interesting to see. We can see it also from afar. If we apply a moving median on another uh, power angry process, you can clearly see the, the big difference uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the Scylla shard aware driver has made in our uh, uh, production applications. From this, we got an unexpected and cool side effect. It's that we manage as well to, uh, since the cluster load was reduced and the client last latency was lower, uh, our, for the same workload, we could cut by half the number of replicas on our deployment, which was very cool as well. So we saved uh, actually uh, resources on our Kubernetes cluster. Recent additions that we've done on the driver, uh, we have added uh, some, um, some helpers to allow you to check for shard awareness and to check for this opportunistic uh, shard aware uh, connections. So you can actually see how much of it is uh, fully or not connected. When it becomes available, uh, we will be uh, changing uh, also uh, the driver to be able to uh, select deterministically this time the, the shard ID when it connects. So there are two open pull requests already for this. We're gonna still work on uh, improving the documentation. And uh, since it's a Cassandra driver fork, we will merge and rebase the latest uh, improvements as well. Um, try the Scylla driver. Uh, it's working great. It's working in production for us for now um, almost, uh, almost a month. Uh, and, and with the, the, the great impact that you've seen before, uh, check it out uh, on the repository. Uh, come chat with us as well uh, when EuroPython is over on the CLADB uh, cluster Slack. We have a, a Pythonistas uh, channel where you are all welcome. And uh, that's it for me. I want to thank everyone uh, for, uh, for attending and uh, making this EuroPython a success. There is the, the Discord talk channel uh, where we can uh, keep in touch and 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 discuss discuss this further or deeper if you if you want. And um, tomorrow uh, we we also have a sponsor talk session 
where we, we, you can uh, join in and we will be talking about uh, a lot of different aspects and, uh, and, and have cool guests from Numberly as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, we have a minute or two for questions. Do you mind some Q&A? Oh, no, of course. My um, <laughs> yes, there's one question that has gotten some votes. The code of the drivers seems to be Python 2 compliant, but is there an uh, Asyncio part, like for Python 3, 5 or better? Yes, um, yes, it's uh, it's an old code base. Actually, uh, the Cassandra driver is uh, is quite old, and since uh, uh, we have been forking it uh, to extend it, uh, we inherited this as well. Um, so yes, it is uh, still supporting Python two, and there are async IO uh, and libEV as well um, connection class. So you can also change your async, your connection class. The default one is a uh, async core one. Uh, we have a question from Roberto. Uh, Q1 shards are pinned to CPU or what? <laughs> are there con uh, corrections for unbalanced shards, e.g. one CPU to be hit uh, by more than uh, the others? Is that correct? Uh, sorry, one CPU to be hit by more than the others. One CPU to be hit by more than the others. Yes, if you have um, if you have an imbalance in your data distribution, you will get the same kind of uh, problem that you can get on a node. But instead of impacting it, uh, the whole node, you will be impacting uh, uh, a core. Yeah. So yeah, this problem exists uh, as well in this kind of architecture. This is inherent right. of a consistent hashing based architecture, actually. Okay, thank you very much. There's a few more questions uh, in the Discord talk channel. So you're going to find uh, that you have get, um, raised a lot of interest. Uh, there was also an off topic question before we let you go. What's with those papers hanging there behind you? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a way to keep notes above my head, you know. <laughs> It's perfect. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to show thank all you, everyone. Us. Thank you for sponsoring EuroPython. And here's a round of applause for you, and you're going to meet uh, more questions in the chat. <laughs>